Mainboard chipsets have seen a lot of change over time. Back in the day, mainboards actually had two different kind of chips, Northbridge and Southbridge. The Northbridge was located at the top of the mainboard, close to the CPU. That's where the name is coming from, because like on a map, North is on top. The Northbridge was directly connected to the CPU and handled all the immediate connection needs for the processor itself, like the important memory controller or HEP links for a graphics card. It was also directly connected to the south bridge. The south bridge, located closer to the bottom and thus the south of the mainboard, handled general I.O., for example, parallel and later serial ADA, better known as SATA, in addition to USB and all other peripherals. But this setup didn't last long. First, the Northbridge disappeared as memory controllers got integrated into the processor itself. AMD's breakthrough Athlon 64 made the first step and Intel followed soon with the Nehalem series. Next, the Southbridge also became obsolete. Well, kind of. Today, all modern CPUs are also SOCs, systems on a chip. No matter if you buy an AMD Ryzen or an Intel Core CPU, they all include typical Southbridge features like additional PCI Express lanes, USB and SATA connections, and some Intel processors even include parts of a Wi-Fi module. The only reason we still have dedicated chipsets on mainboards is the ever-increasing need for even more I.O. Today, mainboards can offer dozens of USB ports, 6 to 8 PCI Express slots, plenty of SATA connectivity and so on. To be fair, the typical gamer who just connects keyboard and a mouse plus maybe a gamepad could do very well without an extra chipset. AMD tried something like this with their X300 chipset back in 2017 when the first generation Ryzen was released, but it never really took off. But I'm not here to talk about the entire history of mainboards. The topic of this video is the next generation of chipsets that are being developed for AMD's upcoming AIM5 socket. And it's not without a little bit of irony that we will see mainboards going back full circle using two chipsets on a single mainboard again. I will first begin with a short recap of AMD's previous AIM4 chipset generation and talk about the secret behind the X570 to establish a baseline before we take a look at the new 600 series chipsets and their specs, explore the reasoning behind the novel chiplet approach, and discuss pros and cons. AMD's AIM4 chipset lineups always followed a pretty simple formula. A X70 chipset for the high end, starting out with X370, 470, and currently 570, and a B50 chipset for the mainstream, beginning with B350, 450, and now 550. The initial 300 series had some additional offerings, like the low end A320 and the not really a chipset chipset ANX300, which to my knowledge are currently only used in ASRock's Destiny products. I always thought the ANX300 chipsets were really interesting because they allowed you to use a Ryzen CPU as a standalone SoC, using only the I.O. with in the CPU itself. ASRock has designed some really tiny AIM4 based PCs with their Destiny series, probably the smallest AIM4 form factor to date. I'm sure some of you remember the heated discussions during the Zen 2 release, when AMD first introduced PCI Express Gen 4 into the market. Some OEMs released BIOS updates that enabled PCI Express Gen 4 on older mainboards, which then got called back by AMD. Only B550 and X570 boards were officially allowed to support Gen 4. The reason for all this turmoil is pretty simple. As I mentioned before, current CPUs are also SOCs. They provide some of their own I.O., including PCI Express lanes. And since PCI Express is upwards and downwards compatible, placing a PCI Express Gen 4 enabled CPU into an older mainboard turns the PCI Express lanes, which are supplied by the CPU, into PCI Express Gen 4 lanes. If the mainboard is able to handle the increased electrical stress and deliver a clean signal. And that's actually a pretty big if. And also the very reason that those beta BIOSes that initially supported Gen 4 on all the mainboards got called back. While 500 series boards were built with Gen 4 in mind, resulting in more layers and thicker copper wires to ensure a clean signal, all the mainboards could not always guarantee a 100% function with Gen 4 enabled. In addition, more expensive mainboards often didn't even support Gen 4, while cheaper boards did. This is because a lot of the cheaper boards did not alter the PCI Express lanes provided by the CPU in any way. For example, simply routing 16 lanes from the CPU to the first PCI Express slot. These connections covered only a short distance and didn't have any switches or repeaters in between, which allowed for an easy PCI Express Gen 4 implementation. More expensive boards, on the other hand, offer a lot more PCI Express functionality. To enable this additional functionality, manufacturers used PCI Express switches and repeaters, but these parts did not support the faster Gen 4 speeds. The result was a strange iteration where cheaper B350 and 450 boards would have mostly worked with PCI Express Gen 4 and more expensive X370 and X470 boards would have not. 
As you can imagine, not something AMD wanted to happen. On top of that, even on boards where Gen 4 did work, it wasn't certified and no one could guarantee that it would work all the time. Imagine the backlash if AMD enabled Gen 4 on all the main boards and just 5% of them experienced connection issues. AMD had to shut it off, no matter how much I would have liked to use Gen 4 on my B450 board. And this wasn't even the only issue AMD encountered during their PCI Express Gen 4 introduction. When Zen 2 launched in mid-2019, only X570 mainboards were available. The more affordable B550 boards got delayed. This is due to the fact that, while close in name, X570 and B550 are completely different designs from different companies. For B550, AMD hired Ace Media to design and manufacture the chipset. Ace Media is one of the largest integrated circuits design companies and they certainly have the ability to design great chipsets. AMD even hired them again for the upcoming 600 series. But the design and production of the 55 nanometer B550 got delayed and it affected the release timeline of all B550 mainboards. Luckily for AMD, the X570 chipset was ready from the get-go and that is due to a simple and honestly pretty smart approach from AMD. The X570 chipset is a repurposed Zen 2 I.O. die produced by Global Foundries in 40 nanometers. It shows that AMD started to think outside the box when it came to chipset design quite a while ago and the dual-use Zen 2 I.O. die is testament for that. It's also the reason the X570 chipset could get pretty hot because it was initially designed to be constantly cooled by a CPU cooler when used on a Zen 2 CPU. The reason I'm telling you this story is because with Zen 4, AMD is making another switch in PCI Express speed to Gen 5, but this time it seems they are more prepared. AMD's upcoming 600 series will most likely offer three or four different options with the default X670 and B650 chipsets and then there is a special X670 Extreme and possibly also a B650 Extreme edition. The chipsets itself do not support Gen 5. All Gen 5 lanes are supplied directly from the Zen 4 CPU which has a whopping 28 piece express lanes but not all of them are usable as four lanes are reserved for the up and down link to the chipset. This link will be limited to PCI Express Gen 4 speeds as the chipsets are not Gen 5 enabled. That leaves us with 24 usable Gen 5 lanes from the CPU. A typical use case would be 16 lanes for the GPU, 4 lanes for a M.2 NVMe SSD, and 4 lanes to connect to a high-speed USB 4 controller. Depending on the layout, we might also see two M.2 slots directly connected to the CPU if OEMs decide to not implement high-speed USB 4 from the CPU. It's very likely that next-gen GPUs from AMD and Nvidia will support PCI Express Gen 5. Same with Gen 5 enabled M.2 SSDs. Games already see little to no improvement going from Gen 3 to Gen 4. Current software just isn't built with these high-speed connection in mind. But this could change in the near future with the implementation of Microsoft Direct Storage which allows the GPU to directly access a M.2 NVMe SSD and load data straight into the video memory. If games start to use direct storage, a system built on PCI Express Gen 5 could see much shorter loading times, just like with the PS5. But if you want a 100% Gen 5 enabled system, you will have a limited mainboard choice. On B650 mainboards, AMD will only allow PCI Express Gen 5 for M.2 slots. Everything else, including the PCI Express slots used for the GPU, has to stick to Gen 4. And if I'm reading it correctly, OEMs could also offer Gen 4 only mainboards. For X670, Gen 5 is required for at least one M.2 slots and OEMs are also allowed to support Gen 5 for the GPU. Finally, X670 Extreme mainboards not only have to support Gen 5 for M.2 but also for the graphics cards in either a single X16 or dual X8 configuration. A possible B650 Extreme would also have to support Gen 5 for GPU and M.2. As you can see, AMD has obviously learned from their PC Express Gen 4 implementation mistakes and is a lot better prepared this time. Not only does Gen 4 require a new AM5 socket and thus eliminates any possible PC Express Gen 5 demands on all the mainboards, but by splitting their mainboards into standard and extreme versions, AMD also clearly differentiates between the different chipset tiers. B650 only supports Gen 5 for the M.2 slot. X670 has to have Gen 5, M.2 and OEMs can choose to support Gen 5 for the GPU too. And the extreme versions have to support Gen 5 for both M.2 and the GPU. Designing and building mainboards with clean PCI Express Gen 5 signal delivery is really expensive and no one wants to pay $150 for a entry-level mainboard. The longer the distance the signal has to travel, the more complicated it gets. And since the first M.2 slot is usually the closest to the CPU, even closer than the top PCI Express slot, having a Gen 5 M.2 slot is the cheapest implementation. But what about the dual chipset? 
That's why you clicked on the video, right? Now that we have looked at the different 600 series mainboards, let's talk about AMD's next step towards modularity. As we have established with the smart reuse of the Zen 2 IO die as a chipset for X670 mainboards, AMD has been open for new design approaches in the past. And we already know that AMD is heavily focused on modular chiplet based designs for their CPUs and upcoming GPUs. As such, it only makes sense that AMD would implement a chiplet design for their mainboard chipsets too. And that's exactly the approach for the new 600 series chipsets. Instead of designing X670 and P650 chipsets independently, AMD and AS Media have created a single chip codenamed Promontory 21. And depending on if you put one or two of those chips onto a mainboard, is either a P650 or a X670 chipset. We already have a couple of pictures from different mainboard OEMs, and MSI even showed one of their upcoming X670 boards without the heatsink. And we can clearly see a visible dual Promontory 21 setup. A first rough analysis by Locusa estimates a 40 mm squared die size for each individual chip, which is most likely smaller than a P550. We don't know what process node will be used for these new chipsets, and it's honestly hard to guess. My personal assumption is that these chips are not only designed by Ace Media, but that Ace Media will also use its own foundry partners for production, just like they did with B550 chipsets. Ace Media is currently switching most of their designs from 55 nanometer to a 28 nanometer process. So my educated guess would be that AMD 600 series chipsets are a 28 nanometer design. Usually chipsets are not produced in the latest process nodes because for one, they don't require high switching speeds. It's also harder to shrink physical connections like PCI Express. And of course, for production cost reasons, since older training edge nodes are a lot cheaper. But aside from a new design, a possible new process node and paying homage to the old North and Southridge days, what are the actual benefits of a chiplet design? The most obvious benefit is that only a single chipset has to be designed, which in turn means lower R&D costs. The same design team can focus on a single chip, only one tape out is needed and all the other follow up benefits from bringing just a single chip to market. It's a faster and more cost effective way to develop a series of chipsets. Next are benefits during the production process. By designing a chiplet based architecture, the individual chips are smaller compared to if Ace Media would have designed dedicated monolithic X670 and B650 chipsets. Well, the B650 chip might have turned out the same size, but the X670 would have turned out almost twice as large in order to support the same IO as two B650 chips linked together. Smaller chips generally offer better yields and there's less wasted silicon space on a wafer, which in turn reduces production costs. It's a synergy effect that works in both directions. Just like larger chips become exponentially more expensive to produce due to a decreasing yield even beyond their simple increase in size. Then there are supply chain and economics of scale effects. The traditional approach with two individual designs also means that demand has to be anticipated as orders are made in advance. For example, if the demand for X670 is lower than expected, a lot of chips would go to waste. But with a chiplet design, all mainboards use the same chips. So no matter which version sells best, all chips can be used. So far, all the benefits we talked about have been economic in nature. It's simply cheaper to design a single chip. It's cheaper to manufacture smaller chips and there is no potential waste. But there are other non-economic advantages too. Splitting the bigger X670 chipset into two smaller chips also means that the thermal heat output is spread out over two chips, which allows for easier cooling and fanless designs become less challenging. Using two chips for large and featureless mainboards also has the practical advantage that you can place the individual chips close to where you need them. If the two chips are spread out well enough, mainboard OEMs could do with less repeaters, since the chipsets itself already function like a sort of repeater. The website Angstronomics published some pretty detailed X670 and B650 block diagrams. I've linked their article in the video description and I don't have any reason to doubt them. Basically, a X670 is just two B650 daisy chained together. It's not an exact doubling of IO connectivity, but you gain almost two times the USB ports, 50% more SATA connections and an additional M.2 slot. The simple daisy chain connection also allows for a easy and cost effective implementation, but it does come with a caveat. Only one of the chips is connected to the CPU and as a result, both B650 and X670 use the same PCI Express X4 connection, which means that the X670 does not have a higher bandwidth CPU link. But since most of the connected IO is never used at the same time, the real world impact will be minimal. 
As you can see, a modular design has very little downsides, but a lot of advantages. So the obvious question is, why haven't we seen chiplet-based chipsets earlier? I think it's mainly due to one reason. Chipsets aren't at the center of attention for companies like Intel and AMD. Most of the R&D is spent on CPUs and GPUs. That's where the money is. That's where bleeding edge process nodes are being used. The main advantage of a chiplet design are lower production costs due to die size and yield optimization. And if you can increase your yield on an expensive bleeding edge node, the benefits are huge. But a small chipset on an older trailing edge node just doesn't catch the immediate attention. R&D time is limited and while a chiplet approach will be easier to design eventually, the initial time to develop a chiplet version still has to be invested. With the first step made, a successful 600 series could very well lead the way into a future where chipsets are even more modular. Just like with their CPUs, AMD could start to use a single chipset design to supply their entire product stack, from entry-level desktop to workstations and even large-scale servers. My vision of a fully modular chipset in the future would look a little bit like the following. The very entry-level is supplied without a dedicated chipset at all. I always completely handled by the SOC functions of the CPU itself, much like ASOC's test mini series but on all entry level mainboards. Mainstream mainboards will use a single chip just like the B650 and high end desktop is supplied with two chips like the X670. Then a Threadripper style workstation socket would use three to four chiplets while server mainboards could go into the double digits. Of course this concept still has some obvious caveats, mainly the fact that desktop grade chipsets have a large emphasis on a lot of USB connectivity and other I.O. which might not be that useful in a server environment where other connection types are used. A solution would be to implement more USB ports into the CPU itself so that the chipset can focus more on PCI Express connectivity, which is also more versatile. In any case, it would allow AMD to completely scale their entire chipset lineup with just a single design, much like with their CPU chiplets, which supply entry-level Ryzen, Workstation Threadripper and server grade Epic CPUs alike. The future of semiconductors belongs to the most streamlined approach, and as a result, modular chiplet designs will reign supreme. AMD's upcoming 600 series is just the first step, and while it might not change a lot for us as consumers, the tech behind it will without a doubt change how chipsets are designed in the future. If AMD and AS Media are successful with this launch, it's very likely that all AMD chipsets will be modular from now on and it's only a matter of time before Intel will hop on the same train because they need to stay competitive too. And even with all this exciting new tech coming up, all I really want is more mainboards without a chipset since a Zen 4 CPU already includes all the I.O. I need. Just please give me the option. I would like to know if a SOC only mainboard is something that you would be interested in. Or are you someone who needs a ton of I.O.? What are your thoughts on the upcoming 600 series chipsets? Do you think the different tiers with the addition of extreme versions are worth it? Or maybe the whole thing is too confusing? Leave a comment down below. I'm always looking forward to your input. As always, thanks for watching and see you in the next video.